we're going to continue in this atmosphere of the glory. And like Pastor Jason said, this morning begins our series on angels, speaking about the ways that God has intended for his angels to interact with the earth and how he's intended for his people, believers, to interact with the angelic realm. And this is a very, very exciting topic. There's many things that we're going to talk about, but I think the very first place I want to turn is Hebrews chapter one. If you'll go there with me and this morning specifically, I'm going to be sharing with you in regards to the ministry of angels and how it relates to our partnership with them in the earth and some of the ways that uh, the angels were, will partner with God's people. Okay. Um, to start off, let me just say this, that angels are not an imaginary idea. Imaginary, uh, angels are not a fairy tale idea. Angels are a very real God idea. Angels are genuine. Angels are authentic. And angels are the created uh, creations of God, the creator. Uh, sometime before God created the earth, he created the angels. Now, we know that the angels were there to witness the creation of the earth because Job tells us that they sang for joy as God was beginning to put together the world. And so they got to witness that and they got to see that and they even got to witness the creation of humanity, which is amazing. Now, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, so we're going to go here to Hebrews chapter 1. And there's many amazing things that we can learn from this entire chapter and I'll, I'll leave that to you to read later. One of the most probably important things to understand from he Hebrews chapter 1 is that Jesus Christ is above it all. Okay? And so that Jesus Christ reigns supreme. He's above us. He's above angels. He's above every other thing that has been created. Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? When we speak about angels, there's sometimes a tendency within the church to say, if you're talking about angels, then you're getting into angel worship. Well... Um, I guess you could maybe potentially get into angel worship if you're just totally obsessed and focused and that's the only thing you ever think about. But can I say this about the holy angels of God is that they will not let you worship them. And so if you, if, if you, if as I'm sharing and speaking to you and you're thinking back in your life about some experiences you've had and you say, well, I was worshiping an angel. Well, you can know for certain that that was not God's angel that was a fallen angel, that was a dark angel, or what we might call a evil spirit. Um, we know from the word of God that there was a war in heaven. And when that war took place, that one third of the angels rebelled against God. Now, that might seem like a large number of angels to rebel, and it kind of is. You wonder why so many angels would get into such rebellion when they were experiencing the glory of heaven and they I mean they had it made in the shade in the glory shade and uh, but the good news is this that two-thirds of the angels did not rebel and two-thirds of the angels still obey God and obey his command and they actually they won't move on their own authority, they will only move according to the voice of God's word. So whatever God speaks, whatever God instructs, that's how the holy angels begin to move. Now, Hebrews chapter 1, looking down at verse 14, speaking about the angels, it asks the question, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Some translations may say for heirs of salvation. What it's speaking about here in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 is it's speaking about angels ministering or intervening in the lives of God's people. Those who would call themselves Christians or followers of Christ or believers. If you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior in your life, then you are now an heir of salvation. The Bible makes it very clear that we become an heir of salvation. Of salvation. In other words, we get hooked up to the kingdom of heaven with all of its glory, goodness, and benefits, and all the promises of God, and all those promises are given to us. They become part of our, uh, maybe I should say, part of our destiny or part of 
uh, what we will walk into, part of the goal that God has given us to live out on the earth. And uh, the exciting part about that is none of that happens because of what we've done to be good enough or we, we don't work hard enough to earn salvation. It is a gift that's given to us through grace, but it's received by faith, right? And so as we receive by faith this wonderful gift of grace that God has given to us, it not only positions us to now live for eternity, the Bible is clear about that, and not only to, to be seated with him in the heavenly places as our spiritual position, but it also allows us to enter into this promise that's found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, where it says that the angels of God, the ministering spirits of God. And you must understand this about the word angels because there's two words for angels that are used in the Bible. The Hebrew word's malak and the Greek word is agelos. Both of those words mean messengers. Both of those words allude to being spiritual ministers. Um, and when we read it here about the ministering spirits, if you actually look a little bit deeper into the context of this verse, it gives us an idea that the angels really are the, the gophers. Have you ever heard of a gopher? Like the person who will go for anything, just kind of go and do the job that needs to be done. That's, re that's really what these angels are. Whatever God has willed, whatever God has purposed, he has angels that have been assigned to carry out that task in relation to and cooperation or partnership with the believer who lives submitted to the Holy Spirit, a life filled with God. And listen, let me talk about that for a moment. Because there's some people that say, well, Brother Joshua, you don't need to talk about angels anymore because on this side of the cross and this side of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we now, now we're connected directly to Jesus through his blood and we've got the infilling of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. And so we don't need angels anymore. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. That might be a nice religious concept. It might be a nice religious idea. But you got to understand where the religious spirit comes from. Huh. The pit of hell. <laughs> and we can laugh at the devil. We really can. We can laugh at the devil. Because he exposes himself over and over and over again. He always overplays his hand. Right? He shows his cards. And, uh, and we're not even gamblers. And we know that. And that we're Pentecostal. We're spirit-filled people. Right? So the thing is, the, the enemy always attempts, the religious spirit will attempt to dismiss whatever it cannot control. This is one of the reasons why there has been such an attack in the church setting under a spirit of religion speaking about the ministry of angels or the permissions according to the word of God, the scriptures that a believer is given as far as interacting with the angelic realm. There's been such an attack against it because if you begin working with the angels that God has assigned to your life, suddenly it's not just you out there all alone being moved by the understanding of the Holy Spirit within you but suddenly what God begins to speak to you from the inside the way he's beginning to direct you by his voice his Holy Spirit the gifts of God that flow through your life because of his empowerment and the anointing suddenly they are enhanced and it's like you go up 10 50 100 a thousand levels why because you've got angel armies that are dispatched to work with you and when you begin working with them more gets done and you go, you don't get worn out now something else i want to say about all of that which i didn't it's on my notes i didn't plan to say it but i'm gonna say it is that it's so funny to me when people say well you know we've got the holy spirit now so we don't need angels it's like they dismiss it as though angels are on the same level as god angels are not on the same level as God right and I got in trouble for saying this in Cincinnati a couple weeks ago 
but I'm going to say it. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, who is God's equal opposite? Now, Pastor Jason got it right. He said, there is none. When I was in Cincinnati, half the crowd shouted out, Satan. <laughs> and the truth, the truth is, a lot of believers have placed God and Satan as equal opposites in their lives. Well, I want to live for God, but, you know, Satan keeps on pulling me. The I've dedicated my home to God, but, you know, Satan just... What in the... God has no equals. God himself has no opposites, equal opposites. There is none like him. He is above every other thing that has been created. He is the uncreated one. Hallelujah. So let's talk about the devil for a little while. And I mean a little while. Who's the opposite of Satan? The angels. Remember who Satan was? He was a holy angel. Many believe he was the, the worship leader in heaven. I heard someone say once, they said, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say it. No. <laughs> they say when the Lord kicked Satan out of heaven, they kicked him directly into the church worship, uh, sound system. Because, you know, they are... <laughs> But all of y'all at the back are doing an amazing job. And I'm not saying it about this sound system. I'm saying about the other ones. And uh, always seems to be a problem, doesn't it? In the area of sound, sound, sound. Why? Because there's power in your sound. And when Satan lost the authority that he once held in the heavenly realms, the position that he had been entrusted with and given, when pride so filled his heart that he was cast out of heaven along with one third of the angels. Listen, he lost his place in heaven and he can never be restored to that place ever again. The, and this is one of the reasons why the angels marvel at the gift of salvation. I mean, they watched, I mean, they were part of the whole Story that unfolded. Jesus going to the cross and he was strengthened by the ministry of angels. And they watched him carry through on something he did not have to do, but he chose to do. And he did it for, it was the will of the Father to follow through with it. He went, I mean, he was there at the cross and he died on the cross. And then the angels are all part of the resurrection story. You know that. They saw the whole thing and the angels marvel. At the gift of self, they can't understand it. Why? Because they can't receive that. Once an angel falls, it's a fallen angel. Can never be restored. What a gift God has given to us. It's his creation that he has. He's chosen you. He's called you. He's appointed you. He's anointed you for a purpose. The Holy Spirit. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, they are not on the same level as angels. Angels are created beings. Okay, turn with me to Psalm chapter 8. Let's go there. And I'm going to read this for you from the New King James that I have up here. I'm going to switch over there for a moment. Psalm chapter 8. Let's start at the very beginning. O oh Lord, our Lord. This is... David singing. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants. You have ordained strength because of your enemies. That you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now here we see the sound playing out again, right? The power of sound, the sound that God gives to the babes in Christ, this, the praise that he gives that literally defeats the enemy assignment. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, David asks in verse four, what is man 
that you are mindful of him. And the son of man that you visit him. Verse 5. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Okay. Let's back up. This is a wrong translation. And actually, a lot of people stumble here. Because what you have to understand is this. That as a believer, you have been given all authority on earth and in heaven. Now, that's a massive thing to say. That's a really big thing to say. But you can't blame it on me saying it. Jesus said it. Jesus spoke it. He said it, okay? Now, part of that authority is that God has given us permission to command things in the spirit. We don't command from our own authority. We don't command from my own desires, my own will, my own preferences. But the way that I command things in the spirit when I'm a believer, when I'm connected as an heir of salvation, I'm now not moving according to my own purpose. I've synchronized myself with the spirit of God so that now I'm moving by the impulses of the glory. That when God speaks, I speak. That when God moves, we move. What God tells us to command, we command. Now, people are okay, charismatic people are okay with the idea, even Pentecostal people, they're okay with the idea of, well, some Pentecostals, with the idea of commanding a healing, okay, because we find it in the word. Right? Do we find it in the word? Why can we command a healing? Why, why do we have authority to do that? Because Jesus said he's given us his authority, right? Okay. We know in the word it says that what we have, whatever we speak to in faith must listen. It doesn't say that exactly, but that's the understanding. Read about the mountains and moving the mountains and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Whatever we speak to in faith must listen. The power of life and death is in what? The tongue. Okay. So we call to life the things that God has desired to manifest and we speak to death the things that the enemy has tried to manifest that do not belong in the life of a believer. And so we begin to command healing and we command for disease to disappear, disease to shrivel up, for disease to go. We don't have problems with this, right? What else can we command? Demons? Can we command demons? I'm asking you a question this morning. Okay. So wonderful to see you. God bless you. Do you come from Nashville? All the way from Nashville. God bless your heart and your face. You have a beautiful face. Um, several years ago, we realized it's more important to bless people's faces than their hearts. Because a lot of Christian people have wonderful hearts. It's their face that needs to be blessed. Uh, they, <laughs> And it's not on purpose. It's not, that's not rude. It's not on purpose. You know. <laughs> Everyone's sitting around church looking like they've been drinking prune juice all morning. You know, it's like, God bless your face. God bless your face. Okay. Start blessing people's face. See? And see, it, ha- it works. People start smiling, laughing, cheering. Whatever we s- command... <laughs> I just commanded your face and it worked. It worked. It worked. Okay. So we can also, we can command demons, right? Jesus actually told us through his word, Mark 16, that this is one of the signs of being a believer, that we'll cast out devils. Okay. Okay. And so we cast out devils. We speak to devils. No problem, right? Somebody say, no problem. There's no issue. We have commanding authority, right? Okay. So let's just dial it back a little bit. This is interesting. The church has no problem if we're talking to devils. But where did those evil spirits come from in the first place? We talked about it. Remember? What were they? They're angels that are now fallen, okay? So the spirit of religion would give you permission to talk to devils. (laughs) 
Because <laughs> the spirit of religion ain't afraid of devils. It is the biggest devil itself. But when you, <laughs> but when you talk about speaking or commanding the angelic realm, all of a sudden, all the religious folks get real nervous, get very uncomfortable. I've never heard this before. And then they'll make accusations saying, it's not in the word of God. My response, go back and read the word of God. Go back and read it again. And this time when you read it, like really read it. Don't just say you read it or don't just act like you read it, but actually read it and read to see what it says. Oh, it's real quiet now. Real quiet now. So one of the stumbling block scriptures that people will use to say it's not biblical to command an angel. They'll say it's Psalm chapter 8 verse 5. Speaking of man, men and women, and there's only men or women, okay, includes, that includes everybody. Uh, we're a very inclusive church. And so everybody's included here, either a man or a woman. Verse 5, you have made him a little lower than the angels. And so people will use this and say, see, in the rank, the protocol rank of the spirit, man is under the authority of an angel. Now, let me ask you a question. If you are under the authority of an angel, then why can't you worship an angel? Come on. How many know it is absolutely prohibited for you to worship an angel? You don't pray to angels. But if you are under the authority of an angel, why would you not pray to an angel? Right? Do you see the problem here? This is an error that has been placed in our Bible, not all Bibles, the correct translation of this word is Elohim. Elohim. Now, this is Strong's number 430, and I pulled it out here because I knew I would need it. I looked in the Strong's concordance. What is the definition of Elohim? Do you want to know the definition? God. That's the whole definition. <laughs> Literally. God. God. It cannot be mistaken. It cannot be mistaken. It does not mean angels. It does not mean heavenly beings. It means God. Now, read this again. For you have made him a little lower than God. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes, it does. And then we read further and it says, you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Now, this is important to recognize. So I went to the pulpit commentary. I printed it up here, and I'm going to read to you what I found. It says, there is no place in the Old Testament where Elohim means angels. Though they so translate in the present passage, this cannot be regarded as critically correct. The psalmist, in considering how man has been favored by God, goes back in thought to his creation and remembers the words of Genesis chapter 1. Now, this is interesting. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 with me real quick. And we're talking about angels this morning. But angels are not the focus. God is. We're going to talk about the angelic realm. We're going to thank God for the angelic realm. But Jesus is the central focus of our conversation. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God... You know what that word is? Elohim. Created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering over the face of the waters. Then 
Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then Elohim said, verse 7, then Elohim made, verse 8, and Elohim called the firmament, verse 9, and Elohim said, verse 10, and Elohim called, verse 11, and Elohim said, and verse 12, it goes on and on and on. Elohim, 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 Elohim. Not talking about angels, not talking about heavenly beings. It's talking about God. Now, some religious devil. <laughs> saw Psalm chapter 8 being translated here. And the devil started to shake. Yeah. The demon spirits started to really quake because they're fallen angels. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Because if you put the angels there, then that suddenly restricts the authority you have in the realm of the spirit. And what God said through the voice of David the psalmist was you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Do you know what God created with his hands? Everything, including the angels. Whoa. 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 Okay. So you say, well, Brother Joshua, that's nice. And I hear what you're saying. Let me finish this pulpit commentary real quick. There is a point of view from which the nature of man transcends that of angels. Since number one, it's a direct transcript of the divine. And number two, it's the nature which the son of God assumed. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. The grace that God has given to humanity. The opportunity and authority that God has given to humanity. He said in John 14, verse 14, yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 15, verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. How? If the words of God are so deeply seated in your spirit, if God's word the word that's in his mouth becomes a word that's in your mouth. Whatever you speak will happen. I know that's stretching for some people to believe, but it's the truth. And it's time that you come out of the fabricated lies of the enemy that you've been living under and begin to rise up as the spiritual being that God created you to be moving and walking and speaking in his authority. First John chapter five, verse 15. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Again, our lives being aligned with the heart of God. So Ephesians chapter one, verse three says, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Now, that's a big one. Every spiritual blessing in the heaven. How many bl spiritual blessings are in the heavenly realms? How many think that you can't even count that many blessings? You can't even talk about that many blessings. And the Bible says that God has blessed you with each and every one of them. Hallelujah. Why? And this is a key. Because we are united with Christ. What I'm talking about today isn't about just blab it and grab it. It's not just about whatever you can muster up in your stinking thinking and they just spit out of your piddly mouth. I'm talking about aligning our hearts with the Spirit of God to such a degree that when we speak, we're speaking what's on God's heart. When we talk, the sound that goes into the atmosphere is a sound that comes directly from heaven into the earth. 
united with Christ. Oh, with Christ, I can do what? Who? You believed it was all until someone told you that they were commanding angels. Well, you can do all things except for that thing. (laughs) Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Then he turned to his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And he said, listen carefully. Listen up. Hear what I'm saying. It's going to be earth shifting, life changing. I have given you authority that you now possess to tread on serpents and scorpions and the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing will in any way harm you. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins... He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So when people try to make an argument and say, you can't command angels because only God can do that. The response needs to be, I'm not trying to command them in my own ability or under my natural authority. For I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I am united with him. So now it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives inside of me. I'm not the one commanding the angels. God in me is. David had a glimpse of this revelation. Turn with me, Psalm 103. David had a little tiny glimpse. And I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures. If you can get it in the word, then you can have it, okay? If you get it in the word, you can have it. Psalm 103, verse 1. David is singing. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Who is David singing to? himself his soul is that right bless the lord oh my soul david's not singing to the lord all over although god's a part of this he's singing to his soul he's actually commanding his soul and all that is within me what does he say bless his soul. now the reason why david's doing it listen if you don't command your soul your soul will try to command you that's the truth okay your soul can be a bossy little thing, right? Your mind, your will, your emotions. They, and listen, if you live according to what your soul pleases, one day you'll be at the top of the mountain and like 60 seconds later, you'll be in the deepest pit of hell. And then you'll be back at the top of the mountain, then you'll be all the, and that's called unstable. Actually, it's all about being double-minded. Your soul should never rule over your body. Your spirit must rule. Your spirit must rule. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you that rules through your spirit and commands your soul, commands your body to come into divine alignment with the purposes of God. So David's commanding his soul. He says it again, verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he says, forget not all his benefits. And he goes on and he's reminding his mind, okay, because his mind's been drifting, Going places like, well, I feel so. I don't like that. The people are just treating me like everybody wants to. His mind is drifting. And so he's got to command his soul. Bring it into authority. And he says, forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. That's the sin stuff. The dark things who heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness, tender mercy. Suddenly, David's starting to feel a little bit better, okay? Satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. And I mean, he goes on, and he's just speaking. 
these things. Now, and we can't go there, but this is amazing what David's saying because nobody else knows these things. We're talking about a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross. David is singing about the finished work of the cross. That's amazing, right? You know why he could sing it? Because praise will take you places. <laughs> and David was, David was a praiser. And in praise, he got taken some places where other people never went before. Actually, he got carried a thousand years ahead of his time. You talk about future. You talk about a visionary. He was looking at the spiritual technology that was about to be given to the earth before it was given to the earth and he was looking into the crucifixion of the Christ Psalm 22 he begins to sing about describe it and then Acts chapter 2 verse 39 says David looking into the future not just saw the crucifixion he saw the resurrection of our Lord so he saw the finished thing the, the whole deal coming together so now he's singing, and other people, if they were listening, they'd say, uh, David's kind of crazy. <laughs> Don't worry about what other people say about you when you're simply speaking what God has revealed to you over your life. Don't get worried or are upset when other people don't understand the places you've been in the spirit to grab hold of the revelation you've gotten in order to see the manifestation and demonstration of it in your life. Don't let other people dictate where you go or what you receive from God. It belongs to you. If you see it in the spirit, it belongs to you. Grab hold of it, take it. How is this even possible? How could David even do that? How is the time travel even possible? Because that's what he did. He was a time traveler. Before all the Hollywood movies came out, David was doing the stuff. A lot of these guys were. And uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That means before it happened, it already happened. Okay, stop thinking about it. Just receive it. Just receive it. There's some things you can't process in your thinker. You just know it in your knower, okay? Receive it in your knower, okay? So, so David's commanding his, his soul, right? You agree? David's commanding his soul, okay. So, skip all the way down to verse 20. Now David says, bless the Lord, you his angels. Now who is David commanding? Okay. You said it, I didn't say it. Now it's on you. Okay. <laughs> she said it. <laughs> she said, we all go home. She said we could all command angels. That David was commanding angels. It's true, he was. He was. He did. He understood this principle. Because remember, a lot of what David would sing, a lot of what David would say was not necessarily his own thoughts or his own ideas. Now, there are times he sang songs like, I'm a miserable wretch and all, that, you know, all those kinds of things. But there are, there are things that David would say, specifically in Psalm 103, that were clearly not David's words. That was God's words. That only came by the revelation of God. And when you get a revelation from God and you begin to put voice to it, you begin to watch and see how all of heaven begins to swirl around you for everything to come into divine order and meet its given moment where suddenly the manifestation of what has been revealed to you in the spirit begins to explode upon the scene and heaven begins moving in. Heaven begins invading time. Heaven begins invading your home. Heaven begins invading your family. David said, bless the Lord. You, his angels. They, there is no other way you can read this. If you accurately understand what he was doing, you can't say he was just giving a suggestion to the angels. You can't say he was just praising the Lord and suddenly angels popped up. No, he was commanding the angels. 
And he said, you got to bless the Lord. That's your assignment to bless the Lord. And then he gave all of us a revelation. When he said, who excel in strength, speaking about the strength or the power of the angels, who do his word, heeding or hearkening to the voice of his word. David knew it. David understood it. If I speak God's word, the angels will show up. And when the angels show up, I can tap into the strength or the power of the angels so that I'm not only operating in the authority that has been given to me. And listen, David's authority was a whole lot less than you and I. He had seen some stuff and had some experiences in the spirit, but we have the finished work on this side of the cross. Do you realize there are more angelic encounters in the New Testament than in the Old? Not only that, but when you get into the New Testament, there are more angelic encounters in the book of Revelation than anywhere else in the entire New Testament. That tells me that as we approach the end of the timeline, angelic activity will intensify. It is intensifying. Angels are showing up and they're ready to be dispatched into your areas of need. Whoa. So, what do we do about this? You begin to speak God's word, angels invade yes. your situation. I got to tell you something. When I was a little child, I was aware of the angelic realm. My parents couldn't see them. As far as I know, my brothers and sisters didn't see them. But I saw these angels. I would see them at my home. I would see them at church. We'd be worshiping and the angels would be moving in the atmosphere of worship in the church sanctuary. Above our heads, flying above us. I don't remember them having wings, but that didn't seem to stop them from flying. They were flying all above us. And I would sit there with my little friend Sarah, and her and I both would see these angels. And we began talking about it one Sunday at the back of the church, and one of the elders overheard our conversation. And he began to scold us. He said, nobody can see angels. You're making up stories. No, no, we can see them when we're worshiping. We said, nobody can see angels. Stop lying. And there was something about those words that shut down the, the seeing realm, the insight, literally insight, yeah. that God was giving us into the spiritual dimension. And I went through my whole childhood years, my teenage years, unaware of the angelic. I would hear people preach about angels. I'd agree that what they were saying was true. It's in the Bible. But I was always under the impression we, ju we just can't see them. We can't see them. We can't feel them. We can't witness them in our here and now reality. That's just Bible stories. We need to quit calling them Bible stories. They're more than stories. This is the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This testifies about his power, his rule, his authority, his ability to work in our lives and do something supernatural that we can't muster up in our own strength. He took it to the cross and on the cross he said, it is finished. And when he said it is finished, he really meant it. When he said it is finished, all of our problems instantly diminished. Are you saying that we're not going to have any problems? They're going to show up. But you don't have to accept them. <laughs> the spirits taught me that we have faith gives us the right of refusal. Just like when people send weird packages to our door. I don't want none of your nasty demonic crap. They say just sign right here. I ain't signing. What you don't want this? I don't want it. Return to sender. Return to. As believers, we need to get more used to saying, return to sender. Sniffle show up. Return to sender. It doesn't mean I got a cold. It means the cold's going back to hell where it came from. <laughs> Poverty show up in your house. Return to sender. Not mine. I'm the blessed of God. I'm for real. I mean it. Return it to sender.
So here I am going through my Christian experience, my Christian life. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was real young. I was in the first grade and uh, at a French immersion school. I'll never forget it because on Monday, my teacher looked at me and said, Joshua, did you get a haircut? I said, no. She said, did you get new clothes? I said, no. She said, there's something new about you. And I knew that she could see the decision that I made at the altar the night before when I invited Jesus Christ to come into my life because the lady at the altar told me, he's making me brand new. And I didn't forget it. And my teacher saw it the next day. And I told her, I said, I invited Jesus Christ into my life. I don't think she knew what to do with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, that was why I looked new. And uh, I went through my Christian experience. And uh, at the age of 16, I had an, a wild encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed and shifted everything for me. But it wasn't until I was in my early 20s. And by this point, I was traveling the world, I was hearing other people tell that they had, had angelic experiences. There would be people that would be in our meetings say that they experienced angels. But I, I didn't have that, experience, that personal experience until one night I was preaching in Ashton, Virginia at Calvary Pentecostal Tabernacle. And after the meeting, we had been sleeping up in the snack bar upstairs. And uh, it was Janet and Lincoln was two years old. And uh, my sister Sabrina was with us. She was watching Lincoln. And that night, I was caught up into an encounter. Now, sometimes I say dream, but it was more than a dream. It was an encounter. It was a nighttime encounter. My body was sleeping. But I'm telling you, my spirit was so awake. And I was in this ethereal realm where all of a sudden, these three men began walking towards me. And what amazed me, uh, besides, I mean, the whole thing being amazing... But what amazed me most is that it looked like three of my brothers walking. I have one natural brother. But it was like three brothers walking towards me. They were taller than me. They were a little bit stronger, more muscular than me. They all looked like me. It looked like we were related. And um, they came towards me. They introduced themselves by name. And they told me that they had been assigned over my life as angels that were assigned to specific ministries that I would carry out in the earth. And it was such a profound encounter that when I woke from that encounter, I wrote down the details of it. I wrote down uh, there was a lot more that happened that I don't always talk about. Um, I met Janet's angels. I met Lincoln's angels. I mean, there was a lot of angels. That, that It was like an angelic introduction, 101. And um, it sent me to the scriptures and I spent that August, it was the month of August, 2004, and I spent that month of August going through the word and finding every place in the word that talks about the angelic realm. I discovered there are 300, at least, I may have missed a few, but at least 394 scriptures about the angelic realm within the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about angels. And um, we had gone from... Ashton, Virginia, fl flown over to Auckland, New Zealand, and we're going to be there for a month of ministry. And as I was searching the scriptures and going through and finding what the Bible had to say about angels, in our meetings, the Lord began to confirm the ministry of angels that were working with us, although we had been unaware of it to that point. The Lord began to open up our spirit eyes and our natural eyes to see what he was doing through the ministry of angels in our meetings to recognize, because if you recognize what God is doing, then you can partner with it, right? So we began to partner with the angelic realm. And one of the things that happened, we were ministering at a place called Papa Toy Toy. And I won't even tell you how they write that. It looks like P-A, I will tell you, it's P-A-P-A. T-O-E, T-O-E. We used to call it Papa Toto. They're like, no, it's Papa Toy Toy. Okay. So anyway, we were ministering there in a town hall kind of situation. They had a movie theater type thick velvet curtain. You know, those old timey curtains that went stretched from one side of the stage to the other. We were on the floor in front of the stage. And as I was ministering, speaking about the healing word of God, suddenly the curtain began moving rapidly i mean it just began moving back and forth swinging back and forth it was so dramatic people were filming it people were 
catching it on video. Uh, the pastors, they were much more aware of the angels than we were at that time. They said it had to be angelic activity. There were some people skeptical, so they got up out of the meeting and they went behind in the hallway up onto the platform to look to see if anyone was pushing that curtain. They thought, thought for sure we had been trying to do a hoax or fake something or whatever. And sure enough, they got up on the stage and there's nobody pushing that curtain. There was no air conditioning vents in the room. There were no open doors. There was no wind breeze. That was a supernatural movement of God. And it was happening in the natural so that we could partner with what God was doing. Speak it out. God's releasing angels of healing into this place. As his word is going out to work healing, he's also sending healing angels. Now, some people have a problem with the healing angels. We don't. They say, well, you know, God is the great physician. Why would he need an angel? Okay, stop it. God is the great physician. But what you don't understand is angels are the nursing attendants. Every great doctor has a lot of great nurses. Come on. Dr. Jesus has a whole host of heavenly angels ready to come on the scene to assist in whatever surgery, whatever process, whatever medical procedure you need. He's got you covered. And he did. That night in the meeting, many people received dramatic healing miracles. And that all glory goes to Jesus Christ. All glory goes to God. But God was teaching us. Now, what was really amazing is, remember I told you I met three of my angels? When I met Lincoln's angels, there were four. Now, something that was crazy about that was that for, would you say months up to that point, Lincoln was always talking about Dana. Dana this, Dana that, drawing pictures of Dana. We're trying to figure out, who is Dana? We went to his daycare worker. We said, uh, is there any kid that comes here that's Dana? No Dana. Anyone that works here that's Dana? No Dana. Well, everywhere else we went, there was no Dana. No Dana went to our church. There was no Dana anywhere to be found. But Lincoln could not stop talking about Dana. So I have this encounter, and the angels introduce themselves to me, tell me my ministry assignment. Then I meet Janet's angels. They introduce themselves to me, tell them me their ministry assignment. Then Lincoln's angels introduce themselves to me, tell me their names. And the first one is, I'm Dana. Dana was an angel. So that's amazing. Lincoln has four. Wow, a little bit more spiritual than us. Uh, we have three. Lincoln has four. Actually, what I've come to find out from that point is that actually the three that I was introduced to were the first three that I needed to know. But there's a whole lot more than the three. And if you just think you maybe possibly have a guardian angel that travels around with you i can tell you this you got a whole lot more than just one a whole lot more because whatever the call the assignment of god is on your life he's got angel armies ready and able to back you up in the very thing that he's called you to do so this is wild we were ministering in new zealand and uh the one night i think it was a sunday night we had asked my sister sabrina to stay back with lincoln at the hotel because we had been doing a lot of meetings, sometimes two or three meetings a day. We were there for a whole month. And so we'd asked Sabrina to keep Lincoln so that he could go to bed earlier that night. So she tucked him into bed, got him all cozy. When we got back from the meeting, Janet and I immediately went up to where Lincoln was sleeping. He was so cute. He was hot. And so Sabrina, my sister, had taken his shirt off of him and his pants off of him. And he was laying there in his little tiny diaper, all so cute, in the bed. And... Janet and I were absolutely astounded because laying across his chest were four feathers. Big feathers. Am I telling the truth? Everyone's looking at me like, hmm. I'm not sure that angels have feathers. Well, take it up with the Lord. Because it's in the Bible, it speaks about a winged creature that was taking away the wrath, actually carrying away the, the sin in a basket. And it says that, that that heavenly being had wings like a stork. Have you ever seen a stork? Okay, just so you know, it's a bird. <laughs> so the Bible says that this particular heavenly creature had wings like a bird. There are angels that have wings and they look like wings of a bird. I think there are more angels that don't have any wings at all. 
Many times when we see the angels, they look like people, regular people. There have been so many times when an angel has interacted in our life, and at the time, we didn't even realize it was an angel. And, you know, I believe God. I'm a person of faith. I believe for all the supernatural stuff, the signs and wonders, the miracles, the angelic encounter. But God at times allows angels to come into our lives undetected, maybe we call disguised, And that's why Hebrews gives us that admonition. Be careful. Because you may be entertaining angels unaware. Now, if they had the big wings in the back, you would be totally aware. Like completely obvious, right? And so God allows angels sometimes to show up in our lives that just look like men or women. And we have to be careful. The way that 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 scripture is about operating and living with Christian hospitality. An openness, a loving heart, a a, a desire to serve others, to live our lives in a way that would reflect the light of Jesus everywhere we go. And there's sometimes when God allows his angels to come into our lives and we don't know it. Because I think if we knew it, it may actually distract from the whole point of what God is wanting to get done. And so he doesn't let us know it until later. And and then later on, we're kind of like, we don't really know it for sure. We kind of know it. Maybe, possibly, it was an angel. I think it was an angel. I met an angel like that, and uh, that angel appeared to be an Asian female. And that was amazing to me because there was so much controversy in the church over female angels. And I thought, wait till the church hears this. They're not just female, but some of them are Asian females. (laughs) You know, I mean, let that blow up your little religious box, you know? Uh, God. (laughs) God God has all sorts of things available in the heavenly realm. And I wish I could get to, I had a whole list of testimonies. I want to tell you all the different kind of, the angels that showed up in Israel and Indonesia, the cleaning angels in Canada, the plumbing angels in Virginia, the painting angels in Pennsylvania, the car mechanic angels in Puerto Rico, the happy birthday angel that came and sang me happy birthday. That was amazing. My birthday's in January. And May 11th, this was maybe three years ago, 2019, whenever that was, May 11th, 2019, I wake up and I'm in that foggy place between sleeping and totally awake and I see this angel through this kind of fog, and the angel is wishing me, happy birthday, Joshua, happy birthday. And I'm like, but my birthday is January 29th, like a few months late. Anyway, God's not early and he's not late. And as I sat there, all of a sudden I began to realize, I have been going around telling everybody, I don't know the date of my spiritual birth. Because I was so young, I was in the first grade. No first grader ever pays attention to the days. That's why the years seem so long, because it's like, what day is it? All we want to know when we're in first grade is when's Christmas. That's all we, we don't, all the other days, who cares? When's Christmas? You know, that's all we want to know. And so I had no idea what date I gave my heart to Jesus. And there was one evangelist that used to say, if you don't know the date of your salvation, then I doubt you're even saved. And I used to come under so much condemnation, I feel... I'm pretty sure I am saved, but I don't know the date. And I wish I did, because if I knew it, I would celebrate it. Anyway, the angel shows up, wishes me happy birthday. So then there was, it's a long story. But Lincoln and I, I got him on the Google, and I said, look up May 11th. Back in 1986 or 1987, because I had the same teacher. Remember that teacher that said I looked like something was different about me? Um, same teacher for two years. So I'm like, I still, that still doesn't help to know what year I got saved because it was the same teacher two years. And again, I didn't remember any days. So I told Lincoln, look up, uh, 1986, 1987, May 11th. Would you believe May 11th felt on a Sunday on 1986? And I looked it up and on the calendar, it said it was mother's day, 1986. So that was amazing to me because I knew that I was at church. It was a Sunday night when I gave my heart to Jesus. I knew that much. And um, so I called up my parents and I wanted to ask them, do you think it was possibly on a Mother's Day? Because you'd think your mother would remember that 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 you gave your heart to Jesus, kind of made a big decision on Mother's Day. 
And uh, so I was calling and talking to my mother and I was asking her and she said, Josh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not sure. I don't really remember. I'm like, but it was Mother's Day. You don't remember. And my dad is in the back. He's like, Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was May 11th, 1986, Mother's Day, when Joshua gave his heart to Jesus. I said, Dad, you knew the whole time? You knew the whole time. But, you know, it was important. It was important for me to know. But it's even more important for us to understand this, that the angels of God, they know your spiritual birth, they know the day of your salvation. Actually, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 15, verse 10, that the angels rejoice in heaven when we choose to give our lives to Christ. When we make a decision for Jesus, it's the greatest decision you can ever make in your entire life. And all of heaven begins to rejoice and celebrate. And you can celebrate for days moving forward because the angels are celebrating with you. But I want to say this. That if you're here this morning and you've never made a decision for Christ, this morning is your moment. This morning is your mo morning to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Yeah. Talking about angels, and I wish I could have shared more testimonies. I I'll do that in a couple weeks from now. I'll do that when, and I know Jason's, uh, Pastor Jason's going to have testimonies to share with you next week when he comes and ministers about the angelic realm. But the most important thing is that you get right with God. Yeah. More than you have that desire to get right with God, God wants you to get right with him because he loves you and he wants to bless you and he wants to fill your life with all of these supernatural things we've been talking about. It's not something to be afraid of, but it's something to get excited about because God's got heavenly backup for you. Amen? So if you say this morning, I want to make a decision for Christ. I've never done that before, but this morning I want to get right with God and I want to give my heart to Jesus. I just want you to lift up your hand boldly. Don't be afraid. Just put up your hand and say, Brother Joshua, would you pray for me? Anyone this morning, this place? Maybe you're here and you say, well, you know, I made a decision like back in 1986 or in the 90s or in the 2000s or even maybe a few months ago. But somehow things have grown cold in my life. And it seems like I've been distanced from God and I've been running from him and he's been calling me and wooing me and pulling me towards him. And this morning, I just want to recommit my life to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to not just put up your hand, but I want you to come up here. Just come up here so I can pray with you. Just get out of your seat. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear hold you back. Don't let anyone hold you back. But just get up out of your seat and come here because I want to pray with you. If that's you. Anyone this morning? I feel like there's someone. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Get right. This is your moment. This is your moment. Today is the day of second chances. Wow. This is your day. Don't hold back. Just come. Just come. Just come. Don't make me come down and pull you out by prophetic word of knowledge. <laughs> no, it's your choice. It's your decision. It's your decision. It's your choice. But choose life today. Choose life. Choose life. I want everybody in this place just to stand up. Just lift up your hands. Just say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for your spirit that causes me to draw closer and closer to you each and every day. Lord, I thank you that you so care for me, that you have prepared for me the ministry service of your angels. I choose to receive, agree, and interact with your angels as you make them known to me. Lord, I thank you for heavenly dreams. I thank you for visions. I thank you for heavenly manifestations, divine encounters in the days ahead that I would be aware 
that my spiritual sensitivity would be alert to the movings of your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Come on, how many of you are thankful for a day of second chances? Come on, today really is a day of, 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 of synchronizing with the Spirit. You know, when Pastor Joshua was sharing about second chances and second time, how many of you know a lot of times there can be stuff that almost seems kind of like abstract? But uh, if you can stop and say, wait a minute, God was speaking. Amen. And I just want to draw your attention to really just, you know, some confirmations just to kind of let you know about what really God is inviting us into in this season. You guys remember when we said, wait a minute, it's 1111. Isaiah 1111 says this, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant. The Amplified says that, that then it will happen on that day, which is today, that the Lord will again acquire with his hand a second time the remnant of his people who remain. And I believe that part of what this second chance and second Passover is talking about is restoration for a remnant that would cause us to remain, to be settled, to be established, to be anchored in this season. What's also amazing, how you know in Acts chapter two and it talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that our sons and our daughters would prophesy, our young men would see visions and our old men would dream dreams. It talks about signs in the heavens and wonders in the earth. A few weeks ago, we saw a sign in the heaven that, that circumhorizontal rainbow, which was all about going forward with confidence and clarity in this season. And how many of you know that God will first say something in the natural to confirm what he's about to do in the spirit? Paul said first in the natural, then in the spirit. Pastor Jeff sent me a screenshot of our good friend, James Spann. How many of you love James Spann? who has an incredible testimony of God's goodness in his own life. He and I ministered together at the marriage prayer breakfast a few years ago. But he actually posted this morning how at 11.11 tonight, there's going to be a blood moon in Alabama. Now, listen, I think a lot of times people can get distracted from the major when they focus on a minor. But at the same time, you don't throw out the minor because people get weird. Amen. And God highlighted a marker of time in Acts chapter 2 as being a sign in the heavens and wonders in the earth. And he said he would make the moon like blood. And this is the very next verse, that all, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in times past, I saw people get their eyes off of the harvest and get it onto a moon. It has nothing to do with the moon. It has everything to do with the sign of the times that this is the time of harvest. Amen. And so can we just close out today by praying for the harvest to come home? How many of you know that, how many of you have noticed that we're just becoming more and more intentional with not just an altar call, but an invitation for new beginnings and people being born again to not just pray to get saved from their situation, but to be born from above. And I believe that there are sons and daughters that are looking to hear the voice of their father and are looking for a home they can come to. So can we just pray together? Some of you have on your heart names of family members, friends, people that you long to come back to God. And I want to tell you, friends, we are in the days that dreams come true. Father, I thank you, Lord, right now. I thank you for the angels that gather. You said in Matthew 13, there are angels that gather at times of harvest and that you would send them out to remove stumbling blocks and to bring the harvest into your house. And so we just speak to those angels right now to be released for the sake of harvest and to come into alignment with this season's assignment. We speak to the lost right now in the name of Jesus to come home to the Father and to be found. We thank you, Father, for breaking off the shame the religious spirit has tried to put on them. And we thank you for the release of the acceptance and the affirmation of our heavenly Father that would break all shame and all guilt and all confusion off of them. And Lord, we just declare that the doors of this house are wide open for harvest in this season. Lord, we invite sons and daughters, natural sons and daughters, soon to be spiritual sons and daughters. And Lord, those who, are, those who you long for that have no place to come, we say send them here in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you that these are the days of harvest. And God, I thank you for laborers that you have raised up in this house. And so, Lord, thank you that we're not just saved for ourselves, but we're saved to save others. 
and to see them come into the fullness of what they're called. God, I ask you that as we go forth from this place, whether we go to restaurants or we go home or we go to grocery stores, wherever we go, Lord, that you would cause our eyes to be open to the harvest that is all around in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you believe God answers prayers? We're gonna see that come in. Lastly, as you leave today to pick up your Kings and Kings kids, we have an incredible resource table out in the Connect Cafe where Pastor Joshua and Pastor Janet have brought just a, a number of their resources to help to support this teaching series. So if you desire to go deeper in your understanding of uh, the angelic ministry, to go deeper in the understanding of how to begin to partner with what God is making available, I encourage you to visit that book table and take advantage of those resources. And you're not gonna wanna miss sun next Sunday when we pick up where we left off. We love you. God bless you. We're so glad you're able to join us online for this service at Kingsway. We pray you are blessed, encouraged, and empowered through this broadcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date with our latest content. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can like, comment on what impacted you, and even share with your friends. No matter which platform you are using, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at testimony at kingswayal.com. We are so excited to hear what God is doing in you. We really are, and we're grateful for all the things that are happening in and through the family of Kingsway. We want you to know we love you, we're praying for you, and we bless you to walk in the fullness of who you're called to be. We'll see you next time.